Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the incidental pancreas cyst. Uh, these are my disclosures. So uh, I'm going to, in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, talk to you about how common and risky are these cysts. We'll talk about the different types of cysts and how should we evaluate them and exactly what is it we're looking for. Uh, and we'll kind of summarize a little bit with some new novel, novel diagnostic techniques and uh, we'll go over uh, one of the many guidelines on how to manage uh, these cysts. So as Stephen alluded to, if you're ordering abdominal imaging, you're going to have to know how to deal with pancreas cysts because you're going to run into them. And so these are several different studies that have looked at the incidence of pancreatic cysts um, on imaging. Uh, and you can see it ranges from as little as 2.5% to as high as nearly 40%, with an overall prevalence around 15%. Um, but again, these are, since they're nearly ubiquitous, the risk of cancer in the individual cyst is rather low, about 1 in 400. They also increase with age. Here's some uh, traditional um, data that have looked at this in terms of the rising incidence with age. Uh, and we recently uh, did a large study looking at every MRI done at UCLA Health in 2018. And you can see that about one in two patients age 80, about one in three age 70s, uh, one in four in age 60s, one in five age 50s. So I kind of use that mnemonic to kind of uh, advise patients on how frequent they are. The majority of them are less than 10 millimeters and nearly all of them are less than 30 millimeters. So the risk, what's the risk of these different cysts? Well, if you take a look at all cysts uh, that get resected, it's around 15% that have, harbor cancer. Obviously, those that are known to be IPMN, um, they have cancer 25%, perhaps as many as 42% have high greater cancer for IPMN. MCNs around 15%. And then serocystic le uh, lesions, which I'll get to in a minute, are essentially benign, but there have been rare reports of, of uh, malignancy in them. Uh, overall, I kind of alluded to earlier, uh, the risk of all, any one cyst having cancer is around 1 in 400. That's what I tell people in the office. But if they have an IPMN, which is the most common type of cyst, uh, it's probably more like 1 in 125. But they're significantly less risky than perhaps people imagine. Uh, but again, we should remember that removing these is not without risk. Surgical mortality can be at 2%, uh, and the morbidity from these procedures can be as high as 30%, primarily involving fistula. So um, again, I, uh, this is uh, in patients with uh, a cancer, it's approximately 35% uh, uh, may have, the, some of them do require surveillance, um, but uh, SCNs and mucinous cystic lesions typically don't have an incident risk of cancer and usually don't require uh, surveillance imaging. So now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the types of pancreatic cysts. And essentially the goal here is to sort of identify uh, mucinous from non-mucinous. So on the left are the non-neoplastic cysts, most often inflammatory pseudocysts, occasionally a few other types of cysts that you see there. On the right are cystic degeneration of solid cancers that are just masquerading as cysts. So these are ductal carcinomas, neuroendocrine tumors, um, and acinar tumors. And then you have the neoplastic cysts, of which the benign serocystic neoplasms and then you have MCNs, IPMNs, and then uh, solidary, solid pseudopapillary epithelial neoplasms, or SPENs, which I'll discuss in a moment. So as I mentioned earlier, serocystic neoplasms are essentially benign lesions. They typically tend to have multiple small pockets or being called microcystic. Occasionally, they can have a few large ones uh, called macrocystic. Um, and uh, again, they have a typical honeycomb appearance, more common in women, 60 to 70 years of age, body and tail weighted than head, and essentially no malignant potential, um, very rare. And we usually resect for symptoms, and they're associated with this classic cuboidal epithelium that you'll see. Uh, here's an example of sort of a, a multi-pocket. You can almost see the, there's a central scar there, which is sort of one of the pathic mnemonic findings of an of a SCN. But here's a cyst that looks very similar, and it's actually a different kind of cyst. This is an MCN. Uh, these tend to have either one pocket or just a few. Um, they have line by ovarian stroma. They're almost exclusively seen in women between ages 40 and 60, and predominantly in the body and tail. We discussed their prevalence of malignancy around 15% uh, over time. And again, here's a sort of unilocular pink tail uh, MCN lesion. So again, the most common type uh, is the IPMNs, of which there is a main duct IPMN. Here's the classic fish mouth, but this is usually only seen in a small percentage of these lesions. Uh, you can have side branch uh, or branch duct IPMNs, or somewhere that both the side branches and the main duct are involved, which is called a mixed type. Um, roughly equal prevalence, 60 to 70 years of age, um, and we see a little bit more in the head than the body and tail with these. 
There's also different histologic subtypes, which I won't get into, but that can have prognostic implications. Uh, and again, for main duct lesions, essentially these are considered as pre-malignant lesions. The risk of cancer is 40%. These are generally referred for surgical resection. Branch ducts have a lower prevalence, but could be up to 10 to 25% in surgical series, probably lower in real life. Um, and mixed types, again, uh, are treated as main duct because of the main duct involvement. So here's a, a main duct, again, typically greater than 10 millimeter dilation, you see sort of in the head uh, and the neck here. Uh, here's a patient who has a side branch uh, lesion here uh, where the main duct is not dilated. And then here's one with a multifocal side branch where you have a large unchinate cyst there at the bottom, uh, but then several sort of other uh, cysts along the body and tail. And then here in the body of the pancreas, we see a dilated <laughs> pancreas duct with a dilated side branch. So this is a mixed type lesion. So uh, I mentioned briefly the spins. Or, uh, these are low-grade malignant neoplasms um, uh, that, uh, again, are usually seen in young women. Uh, they often have cells that are very monomorphic and small. They can be similar to neuroendocrine tumors, but they're organized in a pseudopapillary shape. Um, they uh, can often have in intracystic hemorrhage, and, and generally surgical resection is recommended uh, given the young age of the patients and, and the risk of malignancy. And again, here's a hemorrhagic uh, span. It can be from spontaneous hemorrhage or sometimes trauma-induced uh, hemorrhage. Okay, so now to transition to how do we evaluate these cysts and uh, what are we actually looking for? So in terms of what we're looking for, there's a lot of different criteria that have been developed. Um, the international consensus guidelines have suggest the highest risk stigma are if the cyst is causing obstructive jaundice, if you can see an enhancing solid component suggesting a growth or mass or nodule, or if the main pancreatic duct, as I mentioned, is more than 10 millimeters. Worrisome features are those that may not quite reach that threshold but still are significant, including a cyst size of greater than three centimeters, thickening or enhancing of the wall, or a mural nodule that's present but without enhancement on imaging, or smaller pancreatic duct sizes, or if there's an abrupt change in the pancreatic duct caliber along with some atrophy. Uh, the American College of Gastro sort of breaks this down into symptoms, imaging, and cytology. So again, jaundice, the development of pancreatitis as a result of the cyst, as opposed to the cyst being a result of the pancreatitis, and an elevated CA199 when you don't have an alternate explanation. Again, they comment about the nodules, the PD diameter, the change in caliber, the size more than three centimeters, but they also mention a size increase of more than three millimeters in a year. And of course, cytology concerning of high grade or cancer uh, is relevant. So the, what's the role of EUS? It sounds like many of you feel that there is an important role for EUS, and, and uh, I suspect our panel would probably agree. Uh, so what can we do? Well, we can image and identify intracystic mucin nodules, provide relationships of the cyst to vasculature, main duct resectability, um, and provide high-resolution imaging of the parenchyma. But despite all these capabilities, it's still really hard to predict between cyst types and predict malignant risk. You probably don't need an EUS if you have a small cyst, one that arises in the setting of acute pancreatitis, if you're not going to do anything with the results, or if it's pretty obvious on imaging what the answer is. Uh, what can we get you on EUS? Well, we can obviously get fluid, and that fluid can be used for cytology, which generally has a low yield and sensitivity, but around 50%. You can get traditionally carcinium embryonic antigen and amylase, and increasingly glucose, which I'll discuss. Uh, as well as molecular analysis, particularly um, KRAS mutations, uh, which I think is promising but still somewhat expensive in investigation. You can do this with, with a relatively safe uh, fashion with low risk of adverse events. So this is Bill Brugge's original uh, U.S. cooperative pancreas study that sort of found that mucinous cysts had much higher CEAs, median around 500, compared to non-mucinous cysts, uh, which were really around 20. Uh, and so you sort of created a sensitivity specificity plot and sort of if you get somewhere in the high 70s, uh, you come up with a CEA of 192. Greater than that is consistent with mucinous. But again, this is not an absolute scale. 190 doesn't mean you're not mucinous. And, and CEA is often insufficiency in, to predict malignancy. So if you're trying to use these sort of fluid markers, again, pseudocysts usually have a low CEA because they're non-mucinous, but a high amylase because they're pancreatic juice. SCNs are neither, so they are low for both. MCNs have no connection usually to the main pancreatic duct, but have uh, are mucinous, so they have a high CEA and they're viscous. And IPMNs are connected to the uh, pancreatic duct, so they'll have a high CEA and amylase traditionally. So this is sort of a general breakdown, but again, there's overlap. 
Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go over this much, but <laughs> molecular analysis of cis fluid can be used. Uh, KRAS is highly specific, but it's not that sensitive, and several studies have suggested it's not much better than CA and amylase. So there's some debate as to the cost uh, value for this. Integrating it in select cases, though, may be particularly beneficial, and so there perhaps is a role in equivocal cases where it's not obvious. Increasingly, cyst fluid glucose is being used, less than 50 in some studies, less than 25. Uh, a recent paper that's just online now uh, suggests that it's actually significantly better than CEA, a glucose of less than 25 with a sensitivity and specificity of 88 and 91 percent. And this can be done quite cheaply. You can even run it on a glucometer or a reagent strip rather than send it to the lab. So I'll close by talking about novel diagnostic methods. So what's next? Contrast enhanced US is not really uh, available in the United States. Uh, some are doing research on it. But on the left is an actual potential nodule, uh, which um, uh, we can see there highlights with contrast, suggesting it's actually uh, you know, abnormal tissue. And you can see sort of a polypoid tissue there in the bottom right. Whereas um, uh, on the left panel, bottom right, but on the right side, you see that there's a nodule that doesn't enhance, and that just happens to be intracystic mucin. So this kind of helps you separate between those two and an accuracy around 92% in this study. Um, confocal uh, endomicroscopy is an incredibly um, uh, interesting technology that can go through the needle and provide uh, an US FNA needle and provide um, in vivo sort of. Uh, cellular imaging, and so you can use that to help determine what you're looking at. And uh, it's particularly useful, I think, uh, to look for the serocystic lesions that have a very characteristic superficial vascular network, 87% accuracy, 69% uh, sensitivity, but when you see it, it's, it's definitely true, so 100% specificity. Of course, that does require some capital, uh, some additional um, uh, resources, and so one might think instead of doing in vivo, why don't we just get histology like we do for most things? And so now we have through the scope, uh, through the uh, needle uh, forceps, uh, which can actually get you histology. This one uh, is again limited to where the uh, needle can go, so you may not be able to sample the entire wall of the cyst. But this study suggests that uh, you can do this. Uh, they looked at 114 patients. They were able to succeed 95% of the time technically, and they got an overall yield for an answer of what the histology of the cyst was about two-thirds of the time, which is pretty good. Um, and so that's uh, certainly one technology we could use with the US. Uh, at our institution, we've actually looked at doing it a different way. We just aspirate the cyst, and then subsequently the collapsed cyst, we actually do a fine needle biopsy where we sort of pan across the wall. This saves resources, time, and actually samples a larger area. And we've actually had about an 86% diagnostic rate. You can see uh, this was published in Gastroenterology a couple years ago. Uh, and you can see that uh, we actually had a lot of serocystic lesions, but other types as well, including IPMN and even some cystic adenocarcinomas. So here's a patient that came to us uh, for this. Uh, she had had a low CEA and a low amylase, but had a family history of pancreas cancer. She wanted to start a family and was actually under going to undergo a resection elsewhere if she couldn't get a definitive diagnosis. Um, so she came to us for molecular testing, but I said, why don't we try to do a biopsy? So there's her EUS image, and then actually here is us performing uh, this EUS FNA. There's a, 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 a core needle there, actually. We actually use a 22 core. Uh, and so we can aspirate this cyst, and then uh, we can see here uh, that we actually obtained histology here that was consistent with cuboidal epithelial cyst lining for a serious cyst adenoma. Uh, and so she actually was able to get a confident diagnosis and, and uh, avoided a resection. So uh, in summary, uh, again, how should we manage mucinous cysts? There's all kinds of guidelines, European guidelines, Asian guidelines, all three U.S. societies have guidelines. I'm going to just focus on one because I think um, it incorporates, I think, a lot of these. It's also one of the most recent. Uh, but again, the goal of all these guidelines is we want to avoid unnecessary resections, but we don't want to miss any cancers, right? So that's always kind of the balance you're trying to play, and how do you do that? So, uh, and again, I, I think what we do at UCLA is very similar to this, and I don't have the time to go through this in full. But in short, on the top left, you're kind of looking for things that uh, make you think that, uh, again, uh, if this is a non-neoplastic cyst, if it's a pseudocyst or a serous cystadenoma, you can kind of forget about those. And again, if there's, again, a history of pancreatitis uh, on the top right, again, if it looks inflammatory, you don't have to worry about it unless you think the cyst is the cause of the pancreatitis. And then if it's not either one of those are obvious, you look for those high, you know, uh, those high-risk stigmata, 
And if you have those, you're probably going to send it to a multidisciplinary center. If you don't, then you look sort of for some of those worrisome features. And if they're there, you may do an EUS. And if they're not, then depending on the size of the cyst, you'll typically do interval imaging, usually with radiologic imaging, often MRI to reduce radiation. Uh, and again, if there's growth or the development of worrisome features in the future, then you typically refer for a multidisciplinary evaluation. And again, once you put them in surveillance, we typically, based on the size of the cyst, will determine the frequency. Usually it's an MRI either every two years for smaller cysts, maybe every six to 12 months for larger cysts. And again, if there's stability over time, you can reduce the frequency, okay? And so there's all different kinds of cysts uh, there. So, uh, and again, uh, you can refer to the ACG guidelines for that, but I think that probably most represents what we do here at UCLA. Uh, the cysts, again, are common, increasingly diagnosed for cross-sectional imaging. They exhibit variable behavior, and our goal is to distinguish mucinous from non-mucinous. Uh, the clinical and imaging characteristics are often unreliable, and so perhaps US FNA and cyst fluid analysis, particularly with cyst wall histology, may be able to give us a better answer. We need better diagnostic uh, and treatment algorithms, uh, which will hopefully come with new technology and more data. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, I think that uh, tissue sampling will be able to exclude some of these patients from long-term surveillance. Uh, but we also need to understand we've been over-aggressive, perhaps, in both referrals for EUS and surgery with these uh, cysts. We need to provide reassurance both to patients and their physicians that the risk is relatively modest. Uh, and we can't rely entirely on guidelines for management. We have to take it in context of individual patients and hopefully novel biomarkers, uh, better histology, and options such as cyst ablation will alter our management in the future. Thank you.